So the first is um, whether the ambient level of air pollution, even below the national ambient air quality standard, are safe to human health. If the air is cleaner today, but are we addressing environmental injustice properly? Does long-term exposure to air pollution increases uh, COVID-19 mortality rate? And what are the key unresolved data science challenges? So one thing that I think it's important, uh, and uh, by the way, even though I'm showing data for the United States, this is true uh, all around the world, uh, that if we have a tremendous amount of data, and if we are sophisticated in addressing data science challenges, and we provide important evidence, the evidence is going to impact in policy change. And in the context of our pollution, policy change has led to cleaner hair. So on the map on the left, on the, on the um, visual on the left, you see that the national ambient air quality, sorry, you see that the ambient level of air pollution have been declining over time. Um, and as a result of the fact that data science has provided new information on a policy change. And then you see on the right that indeed the, the skyline, um, it's, it's much cleaner. Clearly, not every country uh, or um, in, the, in, uh, in the world have achieved the same level of progress and um, by reducing ambient level of air pollution, but I am pretty comfortable that in most of the region around the world, when the policy change is informed by data and by data science, progress has been made. So the scientific question I've been interested um, in my lab um, with many of my collaborators is to ask whether or not exposure to PM 2.5, even when it's below the national ambient air quality standard, is associated with an increase in mortality risk, and whether in some population these risks are higher than, um, than others. So we have in invested a tremendous amount of time and resources in in building what I think is the largest data platform in the United States, we took claims data from all the Medicare participants. So Medicare, so in the United States, there is no national health insurance. And but when you're turning 65, you are enrolling in, in the Medicare program. So Medicare uh, fee for service um, include um, almost 95% of the population in the US older than uh, 65. We have over 67 million uh, per, per participant and we can track their um, every single individual level hospitalization for any cause up to time to that from the period 2000 to 2016. As the outcome, we consider both all-cause mortality and cause-specific hospitalization, and we have extensive information on the uh, cohort. So we have a uh, date of, well, extensive information. We have some information. We have the date of death, we have the age of entry, um, year of entry, sex, race, whether they're also eligible for Medicaid. So when in the United States, if you're also eligible for Medicaid, that is a surrogate of lower socioeconomic status and lower income. And then we have a zip code of residents and other covariates. So I think one thing it's, uh, which is really important in doing research on assessing the health impact of air pollution exposure or climate change is the importance of harmonizing and integrating heterogeneous sources of data. So we take massive amount of data from health, uh, and specifically claim, we look information at socioeconomic status, we look information at, at the environment. These are data sources that have been are gathered for different purposes and so then need to be uh, harmonized and integrated. And so it's really important to build what I consider this research data platform, where is a research laboratory that is designed to, um, to learn and to be routinely updated with more information to prevent and treat disease. So the research platform, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more, but basically we gather information on exposure to air pollution. 
we are going to use, we, are, we have been using, and I'll tell you in a second, artificial intelligence approaches to estimate exposure to air pollution at one kilometer to one kilometer grid for all the continental United States at the daily level. We linked this exposure to air pollution to health outcome. And so, as I said, uh, individual level claims for cost specific hospitalization and uh, mortality, as well as many, um, many uh, confounders. So one issue that is really important to overcome, not only in terms of assessing health impact of air pollution, but also in assessing health impact of any other type of climate change related exposure, is that, so for example, you see um, that this map in the United States tell us where are located the air pollution monitors. And so even though I have to say that they, um, we are monitoring uh, PM pretty well, there are areas in the United States that, um, you know, we are not monitoring well. And so because we have um, the individual level health history for everyone in the United States, for every zip code in the United States, it's really important to be able to assess exposure to air pollution in areas that are not monitored. And so that's really where uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning has had a tremendous amount of promise and has advanced our research enormously. So basically the idea is that we take data from satellite imaging. Uh, these are our um, aerosol optical depth. So they provide an imprecise measure of air pollution for every day for the last 20 years on one kilometer, one kilometer grid. We use weather data, we use land use data, we have PM 2.5 monitoring data. We train uh, a machine in this contest, a um, neural network, and then we can provide the daily one kilometer to one kilometer estimates of air pollution exposure. This is work that has been also led by my colleague, George Ward, at the Harvard THM School of Public Health. Also, in top of that, we are using ensemble learning. Uh, where basically what this uh, very busy table shows is that, you know, in addition of the neural net that my lab has developed, there are many different models, as you can see here, that are either based on atmospheric chemistry or are both a combination of machine learning and atmospheric chemistry. So there are, you know, every row of this table is a different model allow you to estimate exposure to air, air pollution. And so the other really important area of research in the context of machine learning, artificial intelligence is to do ensemble learning. So to combine these models, uh, and this is a work that is led by my colleague Marianti, uh, who is a faculty member at Columbia University. So um, in one way or another, we can now provide estimates of exposure to air pollution of one kilometer to one kilometer grid for all the continental United States. So we are linking it to the Medicare claim. And so we had this paper uh, back now uh, three years ago, actually almost four years ago, which was, was a very, you know, was had a tremendous amount of um, attention because it was the first study that really, that really look at, the, at the, the link between exposure uh, of air pollution and mortality for 95% of the U.S. population older than 65. And the important thing is that, as you can see on this table, especially in the last column, we have over 32 million people and 11 million uh, deaths that were at uh, concentration, they, they were breathing levels of fine particulate matter uh, below 12 microgram per cubic meters. So, so remember that one of our research questions was indeed to assess whether or not we see a mortality risk increase, even a level of pollution below the national ambient air quality standard. And the national ambient air quality standard in the United States is a 12 microgram per cubic meter. So to be able to assess whether or not these people had an increased risk in mortality from exposure of air pollution, is of paramount importance to inform environmental policy. One thing that was really striking and important is just to you know, um, give you the uh, main result of the study. So the um, horizontal line is a place at the percentage increase in mortality 
on overall for the entire population when we see a 10 in 10 units increase in fine particulate matter in long-term exposure to fine particulate matter and basically we see that 10 units increase in fine fine particulate matter is associated with a 7.3 percent increase in um, mortality this this line is center of 1.07 so that that's the interpretation of um, a 7 percent increase one thing that was really striking and really important and, and in a certain way very concerning is that the black population in the United States experience a mortality risk um, from exposure to air pollution that is three times higher than the national average. Uh, we also have higher risk for Asian, Hispanic, uh, Native American, although we know that uh, the, the, the sample size for this group is much lower, we have a little bit higher risk for people that were also eligible for Medicaid and therefore at lower socioeconomic status. So these, uh, these results had, as I mentioned, a tremendous amount of press attention, especially you know, during the previous, um, the previous uh, um, administration. Um, especially because uh, the, the previous administration was very r reluctant and as of to today there has been not yet the recommendation to lower the national ambient air quality standard for fine particulate matter. But above and beyond the fact that, you know, regardless of strong evidence of harm, the other important funding was this tremendous evidence of much higher risk among the uh, Afro-American population. And this was captured and captured a lot of attention of um, Senator Cory Booker here in the United States. And actually his office reached out to me and to my team to look at these issues more. So I'm just gonna skip this and just to say that this was an additional analysis on the same data, or sorry, an additional analysis on updated version of the data, but they look at the relationship between exposure to fine particular matter and mortality, but using more sophisticated statistical method and like causal inference methods. And the bottom line is, so even if you're using more sophisticated method, the link between exposure to air pollution and mortality is still there, can have a causal interpretation. And actually, these, these are the estimates of the mortality risk, especially for the population levels below the national ambient air quality standard. So this was an additional analysis that we recently, um, that we published actually just a year ago. Um, this is the other topic I really want to talk about. And so, as I mentioned, as a, you know, in, in, in both these, these two work, we noticed that not only exposure to fine particulate matter at low level and below the national ambient air quality standard increase the mortality risk, but also uh, concerning tends to increase the risk much more uh, among black uh, uh, Americans. And so working with the Senator Cory Booker office, we wanted to start to look a little bit closer at the issues of environmental justice or environmental injustice, especially in light of the pandemic, where we all know that has, um, has affected um, Black Americans in a much higher rate. So this is a paper I've been working on with a former postdoctoral fellow, um, AJ from the Department of Global Health and Population. And um, it's a final stage of review and something I've been very excited um, because I really hope that right now with the new administration, there is an increased interest into uh, studying, assessing environmental justice. So let me tell you what this is about. And this is a, in a, from a statistical data science viewpoint, a very simple paper is mostly a data visualization type of contribution. So first of all, I'm going to tell you something that doesn't surprise you. And I think it's very well known and very well documented that in the United States, air pollution has decreased drastically from 2000 to 2016 and actually looking at even more recent data is continued to um, going down. 
And so the population weighted average of exposure to fine particulate matter has decreased by 43% from the year 2000 to 2016. So the map on top is the level of fine particulate matter in the year 2000. The one on the bottom is in the year 2016. And so the reason why you see less orange is, as I, as I said, because air pollution has been going down. Now, I want to spend quality time on illustrating you these these maps i'm gonna go very slowly because i think that if you can visualize that uh, i think that the message here is pretty strong so um let's let's spend some you know quality time and go slow in looking at what these maps represent so first of all um let's focus on the map on your left Okay, so the map on your left is showing the geographical area in the United States that in the year 2010 had level of air pollution higher than eight microgram per cubic meter. So, you know, because in you have to consider in the United States, the levels are, are low. So uh, geographical areas that have an exposure higher than eight unit are like, you know, reasonably polluted area, okay? So in 2010, the area that are reasonably polluted in the United States is, you know, this half of the east part of the United States, the Midwest and the South, and some area in California, okay? Now let's focus for a moment on what the color of this geographical area means. So the color, the, the, the geographical area, they are colored in heavy blue, means that this geographical area have an higher percentage of the black population, okay? And so, you know, if you're familiar with the United States and the ge geography, you know that that's the case. I mean, the, um, the black uh, uh, Americans tend to live mostly in the South. So going back 2010, Almost half of the United States has a level of pollution above eight. And among the area that have level of pollution above eight, almost half is where the black American lives. And the other half is where the white American lives. Okay. Now let's move on the map on the right. The map on the right, it shows the same the same concept, but for the year 2016, okay? So first, the number of geographical areas, they are above eight microgram per cubic meter in 2016 is lower because I told you that the level of air pollution has been going down, right? So we see less number of geographical areas that are colored in this map. However, and this is what is most upsetting to me is that the area in 2016 they're still above eight are for the great majority the blue area the area where the afro-american and the black population lives so what this is saying by visualizing this map and then we can do all of the fancy statistics that you want but it's important to visualize it that even though our pollution has been going down in the united states there has been not going down. They have not been going down equally in the areas where the white population lives and where the black population lives. So the Afro Americans are still the one that are more exposed to air pollution. So we have done the, all of the statistical analysis, and you know what this plot shows is basically that even though the percentage of the areas in the United States that are above eight microgram per cubic meter and above 10 microgram per cubic meter have been decreasing over time. The amount of inequality, so the variability of the of which are the, the, the population they are exposed had higher than eight and higher than 10 has been increased. So from 2010 to, six, to, to 2016, inequality in exposure to fine particulate matter at levels above eight across racial, ethnic, and income groups has actually increased by a factor of 1.6. Uh, so in one hand, we are uh, controlling and reducing the level of air pollution. 
but unfortunately we are not re reducing and we are not cleaning up the air equally for everyone. Now, the, the last topic I want to talk about is um, our, our recent work on uh, make, uh, making a link, assessing a link between exposure to air pollution and the coronavirus pa pandemic. And this is a work that uh, was co-led by a former PhD student of mine, uh, Zhao, who is now successfully graduated, and Rachel Nethery, who is a, a faculty member in the Department of Biostatistics. Um, this uh, appeared, the initial part of the research appeared in the New York Times now uh, last, last March, where we provided for the first time evidence of a linkage between exposure to air pollution and higher coronavirus deaths. Now, how this idea came to mind? Well, as we were, um, you know, facing the, the pandemic, I started to learn that COVID-19 can cause a viral pneumonia and acute respiratory distress syndrome, which has a very high mortality rate. Acute respiratory distress syndrome has a mortality rate between 27 and 45 percent. And then previously, before the pandemic in July 2019, we published a study where, where we were able to establish uh, an association between long-term exposure to ambient fine particulate matter and ozone and acute respiratory distress syndrome. So considering uh, everything we know about the adverse health effect of air pollution and what we know about COVID-19, it seems to me very plausible and there is a tremendous amount of biological plausibility that exposure to air pollution by um, penetrating deep into our lungs, by um, compromising the immune system, um, by uh, getting in our bloodstream and causing all kinds of, of inflammation could indeed um, um, increase the risk of deaths for COVID-19. So that's basically uh, what was the idea, is that why we wanted to investigate the effect of fine particulate matter on COVID-19 deaths. And so I think that we I hypothesized that because long-term exposure to fine particulate matter, as I mentioned, affects the respiratory and cardiovascular system, it could also uh, exacerbate the severity of the COVID-19 uh, infection symptoms and might increase the risk of death for COVID-19 patients. So we, we published this work um, last um, November. By the way, all of the data um, and the code is publicly available. And what was really important and something I'm proud is that by having put the data and the code available, this has started a really nice area of research where the relationship between exposure to air pollution and COVID-19 has been now investigated all around the world by building on the methods that we have published. Um, and so there are, I think, based on some recent assessment, there are now almost 60 peer-reviewed publications that have established a relationship between air pollution and COVID all around the world. Although I have to say and recognize and admit that this study was actually very crude and very preliminary just because we were constrained about the amount of data that we have. Unfortunately, still now in the United States, we do not have individual level record of COVID-19 deaths. So this was an ecological regression analysis, and that's why the paper also talks about the strengths and limitation of an ecological regression analysis. So what is an ecological regression analysis? It's basically when you're trying to, when you are feeding a statistical model not to individual level data but group level data so we fit different types of regression model where we try to re to relate exposure to our pollution at county level with um, mortality rates uh, for COVID-19 also um, uh, uh, county level adjusted by um, all kinds of um, county level uh, county level characteristics so what we found is that uh, only one unit increase in long-term average exposure to fine particulate matter was associated with the 11 percent increase in COVID-19 mortality rate and so basically if you take two counties that 
more or less you could consider to the degree that you can be as similar as possible with respect to population density, with respect to mobility, with respect to access to health care, with respect to income and so on, the county that historically had one unit higher level of fine particular matter had an 11% increase in mortality risk for COVID-19. Uh, this figure shows that they estimated the mortality rate ratio as more data, unfortunately, on COVID-19 deaths were accumulated. And so you, you see that, you know, more or less this is stable. Uh, of course, we have now stopped doing this analysis because fortunately, thanks to vaccination now, you know, the uh, level of, of deaths in the United States for COVID-19 um, is uh, decreasing very fast. It's interesting that at that time where we published these results of an 11%, again, it, it, it really um, opened all kinds of questions and was subject, by the way, at uh, criticism, especially from the Trump administration, assuming that you know that this number looked really too large and unrealistic. And again, I think um, now um, with research from all around the world addressing exactly the same research question with data spanning from pa from from Pakistan to Africa to Asia to Denmark, actually these relation these uh, uh, percentage increase really it's pretty consistent it, it get get from as low as six percent to as high as 15 or 20 percent um the other thing that this is again not surprising that unfortunately counties that have higher percentage of afro-american have a much higher mortality risk for uh, covid covid19 um also this work led to an international collaboration um, where we estimated the total, um, the, um, where, where we estimated separately for different countries uh, how much of the COVID-19 mortality deaths can be attributable to fossil fuel um, and uh, ant anthropogenic sources of air pollution. And so, for example, we have in, in Europe, 13% of all COVID-19 deaths are attributable to fossil fuel related emission. And uh, for example, in East Asia, we have as high as 15%. In North America, it was 14%. Um, I will skip this. This is work we did by looking at the relationship between, and this is now under review and, and basically the story was to look at whether we had higher percentage of COVID-19 cases and that's attributable to higher level of fine particulate matter during the wildfires that have been occurred on uh, the west coast um, last uh, last year and as you can imagine we also found a very strong relationship between exposure to high level of fine particulate matter on the wildfire days and COVID-19 deaths and uh, and cases I just wanted to conclude by saying that even though you know I'm running out of time, but it's really important to, to consider um, issues related to rigor of the data science when we're doing this type of um, of analysis. And there is a, so much unresolved data science challenges with this type of work. First of all, I do think it's really important to um, allow for uncertainty quantification and propagation. I'll tell you in a second what I mean by that. There is now tremendous controversy and still challenging of assessing causality. Uh, so does really air pollution cause COVID-19 mortality? Um, and so especially in the, in the context of observational data and then issues about re reproducibility. Just to give you a sense, when I told you that we are developing these machine learning methods to assess and estimate the exposure of air pollution, and so this is a, a, a map of the United sorry a map of the uh, Boston metropolitan area and the, the surrounding area. On the left are the level of fine particulate matter, but on the right there is also the level of statistical uncertainty that we have when we estimate exposure to air pollution from this machine learning model. So uh, we are really interested now and I'll tell you this is not an easy job to really try to quantify the spatially varying uncertainty in, a, in the exposure to air pollution and then incorporate this uncertainty when we're doing a causal inference analysis to look at the link between exposure to air pollution and health outcome. 
So there are, you know, the area of assessing causality in the context of climate change and in the context of air pollution is an extremely complex area because although we have developed and there is a lot of excellent work on causal inference methodology for the analysis of observational data, these methods are not yet have the level of sophistication to deal with spatial temporal confounding, with uncertainty quantification, and many with the uh, interference, so with many other challenges that occur when you're looking at the health impact of climate change and air pollution exposures. And so I just wanted to have one slide. These are my, my colleagues and members of my lab in terms of, you know, we have been working on tremendous amount of methodological contribution in really um, raise the rigor of this type of study in terms of methods for causal inference, method for uncertainty quantification, method to deal with multivariate outcome, um, and so on. And finally, you know, I think that, um, and I think the, the, the air pollution and COVID-19 work has been really a perfect example of the importance of open science and reproducible work. I think that this is something that we are taking really, uh, really serious in terms of making sure that all of the data and uh, um, the documentation and really to the degree as possible, everything we do and the workflow is re reproducible. Um, the work I've been presenting and many of the work I have to say, it's so the research data platform is now um, a collaboration between a principal investigator group from eight, um, uh, eight other academic institutions. It's supporting the work as, as you can see, several postdoctoral fellow, PhD student, master's student, and undergraduate student. And so I just want to show you um, really and um, give credit to many of my colleagues that are really providing uh, intellectual leadership in terms of developing a machine learning for uh, estimation of exposure to air pollution, wildfires exposure, tropical cyclone, heat waves, uh, methodological challenges in causal inference, clinical challenges in understanding, uh, the health impact uh, and the several really of the student and postdoctoral fellow that have been uh, instrumental in in doing um, in doing this work. Oh, I have a little joke with my dog, um, and so this is basically uh, just to close um, just to close my uh, my presentation and um anyway this is just a funny thing i wanted to put at the hand anyway thank you again for uh, your attention and i am gonna stop sharing the screen and i'm happy to take any question you might have thank you so much francesca that was such an amazing session and i think i know we have a lot of dog fans in the group <laughs> so i'm sure uh the students really appreciated that um, so we will open up the session to Q&A right now. So um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. In the meantime, I know that while you were speaking, a question came up from the group. Um, and I know you provided a little bit of this context briefly at the beginning, but um, I think some of the students are wondering why, um, like what is the cause of the disparity in mortality rate? Um, between African Americans and white Americans, and I know you mentioned briefly at the beginning, but if you could provide some more context about this, like disparity in healthcare systems. Or... Yeah, I mean, I, so I think it's it's important to differentiate what what our work has been. So what the the data that we have analyzed have said, and something that at this point we are very confident is that. Um, for the same change in exposure to find particular matter, um, black Americans are much more vulnerable. They have a higher risk of mortality than white Americans. So that's one fact. The second fact is that in the United States, black Americans breed high level of air pollution. And they have been breeding higher level of air pollution um historically and constantly in the last 20 years 
Not only that, but one a third fact which I didn't didn't show you, which I found really upsetting. And this is just data, just visualizing data, right? And this is why I think it's important in this type of work also to really, you know, being transparent. They 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 are richer black Americans have been breeding higher level of air pollution of the poorest white Americans. So this paper, by the way, is at the final stage of review and, you know, finger crossed, should be published pretty soon. And again, all of the data, all of the code is publicly available. So this is, you know, this is, this is what the data are saying. Now you are asking the question, why, right? So we haven't done the investigation of why. I can tell you my hypothesis of why. So in terms of why um, Afro-American in general breed higher level of air pollution than white American is because generally, and you can see in the, in the US, um, the, um, the black American think, think, uh, tends to live in areas where they, it's easier to um, have permits to pollute. So either because they have a lower socioeconomic status, higher because there is less enforcement in a quality protection. And so that's why, by the way, Senator Cardi Booker was so interested in teaming up with us because what this work is leading is leading to a new bill, which is uh, hopefully will be approved, which basically saying that in areas which there is higher percentage of vulnerable population, these areas should have a double, triple standards of not allowing additional permit to pollute. Because in areas that are more vulnerable, there is less protection, there is less ability to fight against polluting than in areas that have higher socioeconomic status. Now, why black American tend to have a higher risk of death from exposure to air pollution than white American. So then also there, there are several hypotheses. One is that the rate of comorbidity among Afro-American might be higher than white American. And so when, you know, the levels of air pollution, may, uh, you know, increase the risk of that. Second, uh, could be access and lack of access to um, L care. Third, it's possible that the other thing that's really important to study here is that when we say pollution, when I say fine particulate matter, actually the, the, the soup of fine particulate matter has different toxicity in the different parts of the country. So it's also possible that the PM might be more toxic in the area they're more deprived and so they could breed a more toxic soup. The other hypothesis is that they might be exposed to many other contaminants as well. So I think that now there is the, you know, now that we are hopefully documenting this inequality and injustice in a way that we cannot argue anymore, we can really transition in finding the cause and giving a better explanation of the why. Amazing, thank you. Um, that was very helpful. And I know the students have some comments in the chat that I will uh, share with you after the session. Yes, um, please. Um, so I would love to call students who have not had a chance to speak in a session before. Um, Dorianne, please go ahead. Are you able to unmute yourself? Yeah. Good morning, madam. Hello. Uh, please, I wish. Yeah, hello. Please, I wish to find out why it's planning. You told us that the, the, the south part of America was occupied by the black people. And most often their environment were, were highly polluted, madam. Let you explain that after uh, the deep pollution process, the white, the northern part received more deep pollution than the southern part where the black American lived. Please, I wish to find out why, why, why do that exist? Why, why does the rate, why is it that the rate does not 
decrease at the southern part of America. Yeah, well, I mean, Dorian, this is why I spent, I wanted to, you know, um, slowly show you the, the, the map. I don't have, I don't have a data, you know, I don't have a clear answer of the why. I have a hypothesis and my hypothesis is that there is, you know, first of all, let's be very clear that it could be structural races. And I, what, I, what I was mentioned is when the level of the national ambient air quality standard are going down in the United States. So let's say for a moment that the United States American said, we need to lower the national ambient air quality standard from 12 to 10. What's going to happen is that the different um, geographical areas in the United States will have the pressure to be in attainment. The more affluent area, the richer area, will have the ability to get in attainment. The poorer area will not have the ability to get in attainment. Not only that, but there is a corruption and there is a possibility to kind of continue to pollute even if you are not in compliance, because in the more vulnerable area, people will not have the power and the ability to fight against pollution. This is an hypothesis, right? I, it doesn't mean that that's the case, but now that we have identified the problem, we are gonna we are gonna study why, and hopefully, you know, my mission is to fix it, because it's clear, it's it's there, it's present, and it's an injustice. Great. Uh, thank you, Dorian, for that question. Um, now let's go to Guillerme. Good morning, everyone. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, Professor Dominic has already clarified some things that I would like to know. But one thing I would like to ask is, uh, how do you think a researcher can advocate for these people that are suffering with this um, inequality about air population? Or do you think it's not exactly a researcher's role? Um, it's, it seems to be a really complex thing to fix. Yes, and I, I would like to know, uh, how do you think, what do you think is the researcher's role in solving this problem? Thank yeah. you so much. It's a great question. I do believe that researchers should be objective and should not became, became advocate. So it's important as a researcher, what you need to do, you need to do rigorous research. You need to collect data, gather data, visualize data, and publish it in reputable journal. This is our job. You can express your opinion as I'm doing now. If you notice it, when you guys when you guys are asking me the question, I'm always very clear between what the data said and what I think is happening. Right? So it's really important that you keep that this thing. So as a researcher, we are not gonna be able to change a policy. We are not gonna be able to fix the problem. But we have a tremendous amount of power by providing good science. Because if you provide good science, that it's understandable, clear, rigorous, and peer reviewed, that together with the good, um, with the good uh, policy makers lead to change. And so that's really your role. Your role is to provide science of course, you are welcome, and you should do a advocacy if you like to do it. But I think these these two roles should be distinct, and you always have to separate what your research said and be as objective as possible what your research said versus what are your passion and your opinion. Um, and so th that's that is really important, you know, for your for for making an impact and to maintain the level of credibility that you want. Great. Thank you, Guillerme, for the question. Um, I know that in Crossroads, that's really something that uh, we encourage the students to think about a lot is 
is interdisciplinarity and, and exploring these different fields, but also recognizing the, the roles they would play and the perspectives they would bring to each realm. So that was a very good question. Um, I know we are running low on time, so maybe one or two more questions, if that's okay with you, Francesca. Yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to stay until eleven twenty. I pushed the something else a um, little later. So considering that it's completely my fault <laughs> that I should up on time. So I'm happy. I'm happy to stick around for other twenty for for the other ten minutes. Thank you. I I know everyone in the room really really appreciates that, especially those with their hands up. Um, Iman, uh, we'll go to you. Hello. Thank you. It was an ama amazing session. Uh, I want to know about more about the model you are, you are using to analyze data. Does it use deep learning algorithms and artificial networks? Yes. So for for estimating for estimating exposure to our pollution, we are using deep neural network. And then, but we're also doing ensemble learning. So we are using. Uh, as I, I show you at some point, a very, very rich table that has different machine learning models. And so it's really important to combine them. Um, um, and so, yes, so that's what we do. Uh, deep neural network and ensemble learning. And then to look at the relationship between exposure to our pollution and health, we use both traditional regression model, like Poisson regression and Cox proportionalizer model, but we also have been developing methodology for causal inference. Um, and so, uh, and I didn't, you know, I, I skipped that part, but um, there is a, the, the paper, and I'm happy to share all of the slides with you guys, by the way. Um, they, we have a second paper where we look at the causal relationship between exposure to air pollution and mortality using generalized propensity score. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question, Iman. Um, Ryan Chin, I'm also, if I'm saying anyone's name incorrectly, please correct me. Um, but are you able to unmute yourself? Yes, that, that was close. Uh, uh, my name is Ryan Chin. I'm sorry, I cannot uh, uh, turn on my camera right now, but uh, my name is Ryan Chin. I'm from Mongolia. And as 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 you might know, I have one question about air pollution, especially. As you might know, uh, I live in Lombard, uh which is our capital city, and one of the most uh, air uh, air popular uh, air pollu uh, air polluted city in the world. And because we have like a very cold one, <laughs> what a very cold winter, and then so you know, most of people like born a coal, and then as you know, the like, air pollution is a you know public good, and we share even like. In my example, in our uh, city's example, like everyone uh, gets the you know uh, the side effects of the air pollution. Even it doesn't matter if you're poor or rich, but like it's way their handling is a problem. And my question is, uh, what would you suggest? Like developing cities like Lombard or Mongolia, developing countries like India or like other uh, developing cities, what would you recommend like? Uh, to do uh, tackle on the air pollution and those problems, what would you? Uh, what are the good examples? Yeah. What would you suggest? Right. Yeah. No. And I'm very much aware of um, you know the very high level of air pollution that you guys have in in Mongolia, and that is the main sources in your own country, in Mongolia, is the burning of coal. And and so um, they so so first you know we, we need to consider that fine particulate matter the sources of fine particulate matter are um, burning of fossil fuel so it's fossil fuel combustion and traffic and then there is other things like dust in the United States mostly of the fossil fuel combustion comes from power plants. And in the United States, we're transitioning actually from coal fire power plants and going to natural gas power plants. In your own country, unfortunately, you're still relying very, very heavily on burning coal. And that's, that is the main source of the problem because you, you both have a very cold climate. So to get eating, you have to get 
a lot of uh, so you need you need on heat so you and you and the the source of eating uh, comes from burning coal and so the important and this is not something that you as an individual can solve but it's really important for your country to rely on this research to really put pressure and i think you know on whoever is in, is in charge for the policy to move away as coal burning as a major source for eating your home and moving toward uh, natural gas. And I understand that this is not something that can be done overnight, but that's where I really hope that the research that we are providing can really inform and lead to change in policy in countries all around the world. And in your country is one of the most problematic ones. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a, it's a complicated problem. Yeah, as you said, it we cannot fix it now uh, and just for overnight. And but it's a, it takes a time. But as as we know, like the developed cities or developed countries are they are just they are turning to the like you know green uh, green resources. As we know, like European, like I think the Europeans are the, uh, good at it. Like they're showing good examples. But they're they're actually developed already. They just you know they they go way far from us because their economy and their people and you know they have power like technologies everything but like we have it's the I, yeah that and thank you for the answer yeah i will well i think that you know having the right administration in place the right politician in place that understand the severity of the problem and could appreciate the information from science because also you know, even if they say, for example, oh, it's too expensive, or we don't have the resources. Well, think about there are very established now cost benefit analysis that if you have a population that gets sick all the time with the actual my higher level of, of death due to our pollution, actually it's much more expensive to treat and care with a population that is sick, then actually reduces the source of pollution. So there are really important arguments that can be made. Again, for a transition, this is not something you're going to fix overnight, but a transition away from coal, that is really the major, one of the most important, um, you know, should be one of the key priority for a country like yours. Thank you so much, Rianchin, for that. Uh, question and I know um, the point you just touched on also came up in the chat. I think students were wondering about how um, maybe this like the situation you're just describing about the propensity toward like the two get sick and how that has especially been exacerbated by COVID-19. Right. Um, I know I think we have time for one more question if that's okay. Um, Miracle, I will go to you if you're able to unmute yourself. Hello? We can hear you. Yes. Okay. Um, I actually had to leave where I'm staying because of the noise. Okay. Um, please, Ma, I actually want to ask, and for someone who wants to undertake a data science as a course, probably maybe in grad school, is it possible from another, another um, discipline? So you're asking whether you can take the a data science course, even though you, you haven't taken data science before? Just want to make sure. Yes. I understand. Yeah, of yes, course. Yes, exactly. There are, um, there are now, I mean, I think that, you know, thanks to the, the technology, there are so many online courses on data science also available for free that you can take, even though you have or never done any data science. So I think the most important thing that you seek for introductory course in data science, um, and that's something I will strongly recommend. I think that actually there is data of how life changes can be for people in, you know, in, in, in your generation to learn about data science, because in every sector, not only the, you know, the um, the topic I've been talking to you about, we now have data that can be analyzed and can be used for social good. 
So I will strongly encourage you just to look look on the on the web there are a lot of online introductory courses to data science that you can take even though you never programmed before or you've never done anything related to data science great thank you so much miracle for a question i think that was a great note to end on um uh Thank you so much to Professor Domenici for leading this session today and really um, hitting the ground running. Um, so excited to have you here with us. Thank you to all of you for staying so engaged and active in the chat and for your thoughtful questions. Um, so proud of you for those of you who keep showing up, keep learning um, and keep expanding your minds. And uh, especially thank you so much to Professor Domenici for lending her time. Well, yeah, first of all, I, wanna, I wanted to apologize again 